Anger is essential, but how the anger is deployed, that's the question. It's a fuel, but how do you use the fuel? Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute in which we interview people we call cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good. Asking each one of them our same question in these sort of murky and confusing times in the times of cross current, uh, what do you see? What green shoots do you see sprouting? In other words, what could possibly go right? And today's guest is William Urey. You'll notice in the interview, I call him Bill because we're old friends, but he goes by William. And he is the co-founder of Harvard's program on negotiation and is one of the world's best known practitioners of negotiation and mediation. William is co-author of Getting to Yes, a 15 million copy bestseller translated into over 35 languages. And more recently, the author of the award-winning Getting to Yes with Yourself. Over the past four decades, Yuri has served as negotiation advisor and mediator in conflicts ranging from family feuds and labor strikes to the Cold War and the Middle East conflict. He served for seven years as a senior negotiation advisor to Colombian President J.M. Santos to help bring an end to a 50-year civil war. He currently directs the Experimental Negotiation Initiative, a program of the OEF Foundation. Yuri is founder of the Abraham Path, a long distance walking route across the Middle East that traces the legendary journey of Abraham and his family. He is also co-founder of the Climate Parliament, which offers legislative leaders around the world a problem solving forum to bring about a green energy transition. And so now here's my interview with William. Welcome, Bill Yuri, to What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute, where we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, asking everybody our one question, which is also the name of the podcast, What Could Possibly Go Right? And I'm particularly excited to have you on because you have been helping millions of people around the world understand how to navigate and negotiate and resolve often intractable conflicts. I know you've boiled it down to a three-step process, which you can outline briefly if you like, but we will link to your most recent articles or YouTubes for people to go deeper so you don't have to do the educational piece. Um, and I asked for brief as I really wanna see through your eyes in this most extremely difficult moment when social glue is low, when there's little agreement on the facts of the matter, and entrenched bullies everywhere. So you say you're a possibilist uh, rather than an optimist or a pessimist. And I've been a possibilist too, but lately it's hard to hold on to that. I have become a hothead and it's seeped into many crevices in my mind, all the way down to the weeds of my garden. So I am personally eager to gain some insight on our one question in the face of all that is going awry inside us and around us. Where are the green shoots of another way sprouting in this moment? So what could possibly go right over to you? Well, Vicky, it's a real pleasure to see you again. Um, I love the title, What Could Possibly Go Right? Because as you mentioned, you know, I like to, I used to say I was not, I'm not an optimist, but now I think more deeply, I like to say I'm a possibilist. And a possibilist, mind you, is clear-eyed enough to look at the negative possibilities. Mm. You know, all the things that could go wrong, <laughs> possibly go wrong, that seem to be going wrong right now, including the ones that are making you hot-headed, which is healthy, right? Because anger surfaces when boundaries are being violated. There are sacred boundaries being violated right, left, and center in our larger body politic and closer to home in the world. And so anger is, anger is essential, but how the anger is deployed, that's the question. Because anger can be deployed destructively, and can be just deployed constructively. So it's a fuel, but how do you use the fuel? And, uh, and for me, there are negative possibilities and there are positive possibilities. We're at a moment 
culturally, socially, planetarily, we're at a moment of crisis, right? And crisis, you know, complex systems start to break down. There's this moment when things could either break down, which they seem to be, you know, for those of us who are like, wow, looking up, they seem, or there's a possibility of breakthrough at the same moment. And what determines whether we go to breakdown or breakthrough? And it turns out in complex systems, it turns out to be very little things that shift, just little things that shift. In this case, I would say the little thing that shifts is us, right? Can we shift? Can we shift the way we look at the world, you know, which is what I call go to the balcony? Can we go to a place of perspective? Can we ground ourselves? Can we tune in to our best, the better angels of our nature? You know, can we then build bridges? That's the second step. You know, balcony leads to bridge. Can we build bridges for our the people who violently disagree with or who we violently disagree with. Can we do that? And lastly, since that's so difficult to go to the balcony, particularly in these times when we get reactive and hot-headed, and it's so difficult to build bridges with people with whom it seems like the, the differences in values, the chasm never has seemed greater. There's what I call the third side shows up, which is the third side is nothing but our most ancient birthright for dealing with conflicts, which is us collectively as a whole coming together. The whole unites the different sides. The third side is the side we don't see, but it's the side around us. It's, it's the, the, the friends, the allies, the onlookers, even the parties themselves. You know, it's our most ancient birthright I've watched you know, the, the, the sun, you know, the so-called Bushmen and the Kalahari or hunters and gatherers, they circle around the campfire. And, and that third side becomes a, like a, a container or a cauldron within which even the most difficult toxic conflicts can gradually get transformed like an ancient alchemy from lead into gold. Is that easy? It's the hardest work we can do, but that's the work that's being invited of us right now. <laughs> it's the hardest work we can do. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, my problem is going to the balcony at the moment, you know, it's like, um, You're right. because, because, you know, there's an old saying, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Exactly. Oh, man, and I am penning those speeches. I, you know, like when I get pissed off, I excuse the expression, I, I'm like writing letters to the editor in my head and not, you know, I'm trying to unfold in like the 300 words of a letter to the editor. Some of that third side space, you know, like I get what you're talking about and we all hate that da 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 da. And it's the same time, maybe we're not like talking about the actual things that are going on. Maybe we're just, you know, I just am constantly do, I'm a writer, you know, so. I'm doing that. And um, yeah, I, and I think, I think what you said is so interesting that really the, the issue is us. And in a way, um, you know, I'm not going like, <laughs> I don't think I'm the only person in the world who's a hothead at the moment. Um, and, and so what I'm seeing is that the polarization is in me. You know, I'm polarized. Right. I'm not out there. I'm not trying to solve a problem out there with my clever mind. Um, and so where do you see, how do you see people get out of that, you know, sort of box canyon? Yeah. Well, the challenge is, I mean, there are kind of three practices, I would say, of going to the balcony. And practices, I mean, they're not steps. They're things you just have to practice all the time. One, they're arts, you know. One is the art or practice of pausing. Can we pause? You know, we're so locked into social media and everything and us, you know. Hey, take a break. There's natural beauty around you. Go for a walk, go for a swim. Whatever you like, you know, some people meditate, some people, whatever they do, but... I like to walk, you know, in nature, because that nature for me is the great, she's the great grounder, you know, just like, you know, 
these mountains have been here forever, <laughs> you know, puts it all in perspective, you know, just no matter, because you, know, you read the news or you hear what's going on and you, of course, your, your nervous system gets agitated, right? You know, it's, um, there's, a, there's a little a psychological theory that's ground, you know, about our nervous system that I find useful. It's called, you know, uh, polyvagal theory, but it basically, it's very simple. It's like our nervous system, you can either get highly hyperactivated, agitated, you know, angry, like you're saying, you know, uh, you know, activated, anxious and all that. And we do that, but we're not effective, right? You're not gonna be an effective activist if you're in that zone, right? Or well, sometimes. <laughs> what we do is we go, we drop down, we get burned out and then we drop down into hypoactivation, which is despair and numbness and huh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and zone out and whatever, which is natural. In between those two, there's optimal activation where you have your emotions, you get angry, you get concerned and fear, and all those, all those emotions have a role to play, but with it, they're within the, what's called the zone of tolerance. And if we can stay within that zone, that's where we're gonna be most effective at standing up to the moment right now when we're being asked, we're the ones who will decide, who'll choose whether we go down to societal and planetary environmental breakdown or whether we can find our way to a breakthrough. And it's, it's entirely up to us. It's entirely possible right now. There's still time, there's still energy. I mean, you think about it, you know, I, my, my whole life, you know, I, I started off as an anthropologist, you know, studying human beings, you know, and in the micro and in the macro human evolution, like how could, the question I wanted to ask was, was it seems to me like we're, you know, with the nuclear threat then, which I grew up under and it's still there, although people have forgotten about it a little bit, but how is it that so early into our story as a species, you know, a few million years, we think of dinosaurs as being the extinct species, but they were around for hundreds of millions of years. And, you know, here, why are we on such a self-destructive course? Why are we self-destructive? What's going on? What's the story here? And so I've sat with that question and I've wandered the world as like an anthropologist, you know, as a mediator and negotiator trying to see in the world's most, the hot spots where everyone's hot-headed, what does it take to calm things down, to kind of find breakthroughs? And I've, and I've witnessed them. I witnessed the end of the Cold War and I was there in Moscow and Washington. I witnessed what the end of apartheid in South Africa, you know, the, it, the transformation in Northern Ireland between the Catholics and Protestants and countless other places, the end of the Colombian Civil War, which has been 50 year civil war. So I know it's possible. Question is, how do we do it in the remaining situations, whether it's climate change or whether it's toxic political polarization here in this country? And uh, I think we can do it. I believe humans can do it. We've done it. That's how, that's how come we made it this far. And, uh, and, I, and it does start with us. It's not the problem. As difficult as the other people are, as, you know, as, as difficult, obnoxious, you know, impossible as they are, the most difficult person we have to deal with and the one who gets in the way of us getting done what we'd like to get done, what we'd like to see in the world is right here. It's the person I look at in the mirror every morning, it's me. So it starts here. And then once we do a little bit of listen to ourselves, calm ourselves down, get into that optimal zone of tolerance, then we can begin to listen to the other side. And that's hard because they're saying things we don't wanna hear, mm -hmm. but only through listening to them, deeply listening not the way we usually listen, which is within our frame of reference and just judging, oh, that's stupid or whatever it is, I disagree with that. No, putting ourselves in their shoes within their frame of reference, only that way, only through that pathway, do we have a hope of being able to reach an agreement. And the truth is as difficult and as impossible as all the problems are around us, the truth is there is no challenge facing humanity right now that couldn't be addressed satisfactorily if only we could get to yes. So the problem is us. You know, I remember talking to a, an elder uh, of the semi tribe and one of the most peaceful tribes in the world. And 
And I asked him about war. He said, well, war is made by humans. It can be stopped by humans. You know, all these problems are made by us. They can be stopped by us. It's that simple. It's hard, but it's simple. Well, so here, I'm going to challenge you on this. Um, not, not that you're wrong, but, you know, that's sort of like the, you know, the, um, what is it, you know, 30,000 or 16,000 mile view, however, whatever, wherever Jeff Bezos is at the moment, you know, out in outer space. Um, but where, through whom do you see evidence that people are, people or groups or governments are making the choices that you suggest um, such that the temperature is lowering in some of these conflicts, whether you're involved or not. It's just like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me say this. Uh, I see it all, everywhere. I mean, I, I do see, because the thing is the media, they don't cover these stuff because they, they they're, they're, they're an industry based on fear mostly, right? And kind of get, so, so they're gonna cover the bad news, right? They're never gonna cover when there's a constructive thing or rarely, I shouldn't say never, but they, they, they rarely, you know, they, they, you know what, if I read the news and I read the news every day, it's, it's you know, bad news basically. And um, so it's happening. It's happening at small scale in communities around the world. It's happening in large scale in, some, in a lot of societies. There's a lot of stuff going on. I'm not saying, and accompanying with the stuff that's really difficult where things are actually, the temperature is not just going, not going down, the temperature is zooming up, you know, like in our country, you know, we just went through, you know, it's funny, I spent, I spent the majority of my life working on intractable conflicts, impossible conflicts around the world, you know, the Middle East, Yugoslavia, you know, Chechnya, Venezuela, Colombia, you name it, Cold War, only discover that in my own country, we have an intractable conflict, you know, a seemingly intractable conflict. And what makes an impossible conflict? To me, it's three things. The emotions are toxic, right? So toxic anger, toxic fear, toxic denial. The second thing is the positions that people take. This is right, this is, you know, are deeply entrenched, rigidly opposed. And the third thing is the way they deal with it is they fight, you know, fight, you know, try to tear down the democracy, you know, fight, you know, whatever it is, people fight to the point of violence. And, and the question is, how do we transform the conflict? You know, to think somehow we have this imaginary idea that conflicts get resolved. Most of these conflicts, they don't get resolved. I'm sorry to say, I've worked in this field for a long time. They don't get resolved. You know, the conflict in South Africa didn't get resolved. It's still going on. You know, the conflict in Northern Ireland didn't get resolved, it's still going on. But it gets, it, it gets transformed. And what that means is, instead of basically using very destructive means like violence and killing each other and genocide and all kinds of terrible things, people decide to try to handle the conflict through democratic means, through elections, through democracy, through dialogue, through whatever, but it's, it continues to be conflictual. It's not like you end conflict. Um, I think that would be utopian. And in fact, maybe even not desirable because conflict, as you know, whenever there's injustice, I, I believe actually the world needs more conflict, not less conflict. Mm -hmm. and because, but it needs healthy conflict. And the way to get to healthy conflict it's hard and we're in that moment and we're learning. And, we, and you know, as human beings, we, we, learn, we always prefer to learn the hard way before we learn the easy way. I don't know why, but, but we're slow learners in that sense. And there's a lot of possibility I see out there. Um, you know, I, I just give you, I mean, I, for the, in the last decade, the thing I spent the most time on was the Colombian Civil War. People said that's absolutely impossible. 50 years of civil war, never gonna end. It's so deeply entrenched in the society. You know, 250,000 people dead, 8 million uh, victims, mostly women, you know, just, it's, it was just God awful. And, you know, and over seven years, eight years working very closely as, a, as an advisor to the president and with others and whatever, you know, just we're able to transform that conflict. Is it over? Nope, it's not over. Does Columbia still have a lot of problems? It does. 
but it's changed, it's transformed. And, that, and, that, and that's hard work. It's not utopian work, but it's the work that we're called upon to do. It's the work that Martin Luther King called upon us to do. You know, there was a transformation of the civil rights movement. Is it over? <laughs> Obviously we know not, right? Uh, and that's the work that Gandhi called upon us to do. And Gandhi incidentally believed in anger. You know, he believed, he thought anger was a holy fuel. I remember talking to his grandson once. He said, that's the fuel. He said, but don't waste it. We waste the anger. We waste the anger by lashing out, by this and that. No, anger is the key fuel for, for action, but use it, husband it carefully, use it skillfully, and it will get you where you want to go. We need more anger in the world, but anger well deployed. So I'm going to drill down. I'm just, I'm trying to like pull you down from the general to the specific. Please, here. please, um, please. And like, okay, in terms of, let's say, things that are hot button issues, like right. gun control, like abortion, like, uh, right. oh, let's just take the one that's, that's like super hot now, um, which is critical race theory. You know, I mean, the fact that that was nabbed by a marketer, they figured out that they could rebrand it as something that would stick to Democrats and never let go. And now there are face-offs. We had one in our own community. How do you, you know, like, so how do you, how, how do you approach something like that where, where the, the term that was being used as a way to unlock something about the problem suddenly gets grabbed, redefined and deployed against the people who've been trying to find the middle way, if you will. Okay, so rock and roll, tell us. Okay, rock and roll. So let's just take it through, you know, the, what I call the three transformations. You have to transform a conflict. First, you gotta go to the balcony, which means transform the way your perspective transform the way you see the conflict. So we're on the balcony right now, right? So you, you zoom in, right? And you say, what do we, what's really wanted here? What, what would you like to see? What's, what's the deep, what would you, let me ask you this because you're, you've obviously thought a lot about this. What would you like to see? What's, what's, what's the deep interest here? What do you most want? Behind the critical theory whole thing, what, that's all kind of a thing, but what, what do you most want? What is it? Yeah, what I want is to live in a society where we're solving our problems together. You know, where okay. stuff, stuff comes up and rather than facing off, we circle up. Okay, great. Okay, you've zoomed in. You do, okay, you zoomed in. You, you, you kind of located what you most want, which is I want to see a society in which people solve their problems together, right? So then every single action that you take with your anger, you hold it up against that criterion. Is this going to lead, bring me closer to a society in which we're gonna all solve our problems together? Or am I, am I gonna be part of the solution or am I gonna be part of the problem, mm -hmm. right? So that, the key thing about going to balcony is just to keep your eyes on the prize because the truth is in conflict, we lose sight of the prize of course, and we end up acting in ways that go directly opposite to what we're trying to achieve. So that's why it's so important to go to the balcony because if you don't, you'll go in the opposite direction, right? You'll, you'll end up putting fuel on the fire instead of putting the fire out, which is what you wanna do in order to, in order to you know, work together. And then knowing that from the balcony, then, okay, let's approach the other side for a moment, okay? That's some work on yourself, right? <laughs> you, you zoom in and actually you zoom out and you see the big picture, right? So if you look at the big picture, the big societal picture in which critical race theory plays a role, it's like there's a play going on, right? It's a play and there are a lot of actors in the play and you identify who are the key actors who, and, and, and just, just for a moment, having a look, looking at that play, taking that big picture, who, let me ask you this question, who would you like to influence? Who could do, who could do what tomorrow morning that would change, move towards a more constructive way of solving problems in the society, including around critical race theory. 
Oh, it would be so nice if Mitch McConnell had a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> I mean, really, okay. he's sort of a linchpin in the Congress, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, let's take old Mitch here. Okay. So, uh, you know, you have to be audacious, right? So take Mitch. Let's go to the top here. Let's take Mitch as, you know, Mitch is, he's one player in this, but he's a key player and a lot of the forces get played out through him, right? So, so let's just take him. What would you like Mitch to do? I would like him without losing face, you know, because he's, you know, he's taken positions. But, you know, the way he did, which was slightly charming, you know, in the, in the trial is that he voted not to impeach. And then he gave a blistering speech about Trump. Not that I, I'm wanting him to do blistering speeches, but he found a way to both be of integrity and, you know, hold to his persona and, you know, hold the line in his party. So I would like him to find a way to make it right, you know, with himself and his colleagues without losing face, with them maintaining their dignity, blah, 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 you know, without losing their base to say something like, I would like him to have it be his idea that we, we need to fundamentally lower the temperature on the kind of polarization in this country because we're gonna get nothing done. And so the Republicans are going to take responsibility for whatever it is, you know, he's going to get whatever it is passed, you know, like whether it's, you know, the, you know, S1 or, you know, whatever. But I mean, that's what I'd like to see happen to, for him to find a face saving way to switch his tune and carry his people along with him. And, and, just make this strange misapprehension about critical race theory go away. Okay. Well, that's, that was a little wordy, but that was no, like. That's really good, Vicki. I think we're on a roll here because we're just making some progress. I'm not saying we're there yet. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, but the, you went to the balcony. Now, you, now you're thinking about how to build him a bridge, what I call golden bridge. In other words, make it as, our job is not to make it harder for the other side. Our job is to make it as easier as possible for them to make the decision we want them to make. So your job now is how do I make it as easy as possible for Mitch McConnell to do the right thing, right? To come out, make that statement you'd like him to make that puts critical race theory to bed or, in th or you know, puts that whole, so somehow advances. So. One very useful exercise, we're not gonna have time for you to do this on the, on the podcast, but just for you to think about is, what I find is one of the most useful exercises is to write the other side's victory speech. Right. In, in other words, you may recall this from our previous encounter. So in other words, just write out, it doesn't have to be long, it could be just, what would be the three bullet points, the three talking points if imagine Mitch McConnell talking to the people he cares about, it might be his constituents in Kentucky, it might be his key donors, it might be the Republican caucus, just think about who the audience is for a moment. And imagine just the way you were doing beautifully, like, okay, he's got to save face, he's got to keep his constituency, he's got to do something a little bit like he did around the impeachment. Um, and write down what he could, why he has chosen to follow Vicki Robbins advice <laughs> and although it's his idea <laughs> and not yours, that's very important. That's the key part of building a golden bridge is that it has to be his idea. Right. Uh, and, and think about why, what argument he could make to his colleagues or to his constituents, the people he cares about, about why it's important to lower the temperature in America, why it's so vital to lower the temperature in America. If, if, if you were for a moment, just, just if I could put you on the spot here, let's imagine you were Mitch. What would you say? What would, like in, in like 30 seconds, what could you say? You said, I've 
it's so important for us as Americans to lower the temperature because A, B, and C. What would the- I don't think he would say it out loud. I think he would say it to key Republicans and he'd say, um, and you know, uh, I just- No, but say it in the first person, if you would, if you were Mitch. Oh, right. Play with right. Me and me. I'd be talking to, you know, like my key Republicans and my key donors behind right. closed doors. And I would say, um, uh, the Republican brand is getting creamed by uh, Mr. Trump and we have to avoid him capturing the nomination in 2024. We simply do because it's the preservation of our party and it's the preservation of our, our larger agenda. So I think we need to take this critical race theory idea away from him and so that we can salvage the Republican party. That's that was that's okay. an idea. Well, that's good. I mean, you're you're on there. You're on the path. That's 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 what's called upon. And and you see that the thing is, as you as you said it, let me just say, do you think it's at all impossible that he could actually say those things? Oh, I don't think it's impossible at all. I think he's calcul he's calculating up the union. Okay. So so <laughs> that's the job exactly. So that's so it's possible. So it's possible. So you so you just for a moment you went to, rather than just putting your hot head to work, you went to the balcony first mm -hmm. and said, wait, that energy, that, that anger is really, I can put it into constructive action. You zoomed in, you decided what was most important to you, what the prize was, which was all of us learning to solve our problems together as Americans. You zoomed out, saw the play, identified a key actor, Mitch McConnell. You put yourself in his shoes, you tried to say, from his point of view, what would be a victory? How, what could he say? And now your job is, how do you make it easier for him to say that? And that's where the third side comes in, which is the third side is just a name for the community. It's for the larger community. Because as bitter as this polarization as Amer Americans, there's a larger American community, a larger whole to which we all belong and which we occasionally remember, you know, the, you know, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the, whatever it is, the Union, you know, what Lincoln stood for and all of that. So um, we remember that. And so how could the third side in this case show up and encourage Mitch to make it easier for him to do the right thing? Who, 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 you know, who would you, who would Mitch have to hear from that would kind of say, yeah, Bill go Yuri, ahead. Mitch. by the way. What's that? Bill Yuri. <laughs> well, okay, you're starting right here. Okay, you've got a third cider right here. And, and I think, I the think thing is, 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 this is what I found. Is, I think, you know, the pollsters actually yeah. can, re, are revealing yeah. that Americans agree. Yeah. Uh, largely on, you know, a more compassionate, if you will, whether it's left or right, a more compassionate, dignified, and literally, you know, progressive as in making progress on things. I think that the pollsters would, the polling would have to go really south. There you go. So you could you start to write a play, you envision it for a moment. Mitch hears from pollsters, Republican pollsters, right? Frank Luntz, for example. You know, it's yeah, a, right, something. Frank. Let's get Frank in there. <laughs> yeah, no, Frank. Frank. He spent he spent his lifetime listening to the Republicans and everything, and you know, he he knows how to frame things. So, you know, then you think, okay, how you know, how could how could it, maybe you wanted to have a conversation with Frank? You know, so invite him on the podcast. He, he might show up. <laughs> oh yes! Oh, brilliant idea. And, and uh, no, seriously, because no, seriously. You know, he's interested in how America, you know, what could possibly go, you know, I think, I think he, he might, he might very well. And, uh, and then that's how you do it. Then you seed him. And then you think, you know, M Mitch McConnell also cares about lead Republican donors. He's like big on that, you know, the big business people. Well, you know, business in this, in this country right now is really worried about toxic polarization. Toxic polarization is terrible for business. They have to choose between one or the other and they lose customers and, and it yeah. sends the markets down and everything is bad. So, you know, like you saw in the recent uh, election, I, I talked to, you know, like the Chamber of Commerce came out. The Chamber of Commerce, believe it or not, came out and said, you know, cool, lower the temperature. 
you know, the right. biggest businesses, you know, the business roundtable, lower the temperature. So, so Mitch listens to them. Those are his big donors. That's a big constituency for him. So just, in other words, Larry Fink, Jamie Dimon. Yeah, really. Yeah. Right. He start, okay. You're all friends. So it's not a problem. Well, there you go. He starts to hear from Frank, from big business, from National Chamber of Commerce, from the Business Roundtable. Here's this, maybe someone in Kentucky. He starts to hear these messages and they encourage him to do what he already wants to do. He cares about the Republican Party. He cares about his legacy right now. He's old, you know, he's, he's not gonna run for another term. He's right. gonna, he cares about his legacy and his legacy is in danger. You can help him craft it so that he can do the right thing. And then once you do that, the key thing is once he did the right thing, what are the Democrats likely to do and respond? A lot of people will just, you know, so you got to- It wasn't right enough, right? So we have to deal with the Democrats. So, so then you, you think about who in the Democratic party, maybe it's Joe Biden, you know, Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell are, are kind of friends, you know? Yeah. Uh, they have a past, they were able to work together. So what could Joe Biden say in response to Mitch? And then what? And then and then you start to open up new possibilities where it seemed to be impossible. That's, yeah, it's that's sort of like doing, it's sort of like doing a power analysis. You know, yeah. it has a little bit of that. You know, getting out of you know going to the balcony, getting out of the hot head, and then looking at the territory and the characters. And I've noticed, you know, listening to others, other of your talks. I've noticed that a very common theme, and that's why I used it here, is, is giving people a pathway out of the stuck place that in which they don't lose face, they maintain their dignity, and they don't look like they're losing. That's exactly it. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I'm just gonna pull on you for one second. I'm gonna do it because I'm gonna I see I'm gonna see if I can drag you down into a specific what you see specifically now, are there organizations, are there states, are there governors, are there, you know, business, you know, where do you see people exercising this muscle that you're talking about specifically? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not, I, actually, believe it or not, I'm not that good with names, but I've definitely heard instances and there are, there are governors, I mean, the governor here in this state, Colorado, Jared Polis, he, you know, this, this state is kind of balanced between red and blue, you know, uh, and it was for a long time, it was a swing state and, you know, and, you know, around COVID and around everything. So, you know, just as an example, I'm not saying, you know, he's, but, but it's just as an example, he has to balance, as a governor, you can't just be ideological. You have to like, govern a state, right? right. Um, and, and there are, there are many others. Uh, there are Republican counterparts of his that there's the, the governor, Larry Hogan, the governor of, of Maryland, same kind of thing through COVID through Maryland, which is again, a divided state. He was able to, you know, he brings, there's, they bring problem solving. Do you know that there's a caucus in, in, the, in, the, in the Congress called the Problem Solvers Caucus? Right. And, you know, there are people, if you look at that, the people who basically are your allies, they want to see an America where people can solve problems. The, the Chamber of Commerce does too. I can tell you, I've talked to them. Uh, I've talked to labor unions, you know, the AFL, CI, you know, CIO, they want this to work. Uh, faith leaders mm -hmm. of, of various kinds, you know, even, even so-called, you know, fundamentalists, you know, people are worried about the fate of this country. They can see the, the country that they love going down the drain. No one wants to see that. You know, you go back to, um, I was in Washington a couple weeks ago and I went back to the Lincoln Memorial and I read the second inaugural address again. Mm -hmm. You know, with malice toward none, mm -hmm. with charity for all, let us bind up the wounds of this nation. You know, that's what's being called for. Well, I think that is a perfect note to wind this up on. I, I hope that I've been the fall guy for, or fall girl, for many people thinking through the intractable problems that they're up against. I really feel like I've been served, you know, I didn't come to this for therapy, but, <laughs> but you know, I really feel like I've been served by, by, you know, what you did is you allowed my better angels to function here um, and to 
remove myself from what I feel is a, is a pretty low level consciousness where I am reacting to extreme voices in the media and I'm reacting to the, the, the character of the media that it, um, it, it's, it's provocative, you know, and I get provoked. So I think he, he sort of walked me from reactive to strategic in just a short half hour. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome, Vicky, and I hope everyone can do this. I have to do this work every day myself. I'm not saying I'm, you know, this is this is hard-earned lessons, and I fall off the balcony a lot, and you got to get back on the balcony. It's it's a lifelong practice, and I want to wish you and every one of your listeners and viewers just every success in because only together can we do this, you know. And if not now, when? And if not us, who? Exactly. We, you know, the, we are the ones we've been waiting for, you know, and, right. and we are the third space. Uh, yeah, we, exactly. are, we are it. We are it. And um, so thank you so much, Bill, for entertaining this question and being with me on the podcast. Um, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome, Nikki. You're so welcome. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Cher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com. <laughs>